Hello, I'm Roger Bisbee from Skill Builder, and I'm delighted to say that we have the return of Martin Bridges. Martin proved to be very popular when he came on and told us about the future of heating and where boilers, gas boilers specifically. We got great response from that, good views, and by popular demand, he's agreed to come back and see us. So hello, Martin, how are you doing? Hi, Roger, I'm yeah, very well, thank you. Just before we go any further, I, I, I've done a couple of controversial type of things on heat pumps which have got me in for a lot of flack and people and, and people are saying you're being sponsored by the gas boiler manufacturers you know and and they think that i'm disrespecting heat pumps just because uh, somebody's paying me a shilling so you're not paying me anything are you at all <laughs> um let's just say i have worked i have done some videos for you back in the dim distant past but then i've done videos for other people and i've also done videos for heat pump manufacturers and you actually sell heat pumps is that right that's right yeah and in fact you did a video uh, at richard soper's house and so the irony of it isn't lost on me no we've been selling heat pumps since uh, 2008 so 13 years in fact we launched a new suite of heat pumps only last week so you're firmly you've got a foot in both camps which is very very sensible and uh, is this right that the government was planning to find boiler manufacturers if they didn't sell a percentage of heat pumps. Is there any truth in that rumour or not? Yes, it's in uh, the Heat and Building Strategy paper, which was released about three or four weeks ago. Uh, none of this is regulation or policy yet. It, it's their intention, their ambition, if you like. Yeah, yeah. And one of them was uh, in there, they call it a market mechanism. And that is to levy a quota of heat pumps against gas and oil boiler manufacturers and it goes on a it, it starts on a scale of 30,000 heat pumps a year in 2024 must be sold this way and it goes up to 2028 where 210,000 heat pumps uh, they would like to see sold this way and based upon market share, so if you've got, let's say, a 20% boiler market share, then you would be obliged to sell about 40,000 heat pumps a year in 2028, which is more than the entire market presently. <laughs> and what, um, ha and what but, happens if you don't sell them? Well, then you will be fined. Well, you can do two things. You can either buy a credit or a certificate, they're calling it, from... Uh, somebody who has sold enough heat pumps. So a specialist heat pump manufacturer who doesn't sell boilers, yet we would end up buying some certificates probably off them, uh, or you will be fined. And it, it stands to reason the fine is going to be worse than actually selling the heat pump. Otherwise, why would you not? It's so this is kind of like a carbon offsetting thing where you're buying from somebody else that is selling heat pumps, basically. That's, that's what it's like, isn't it? That, that's one of the ways of achieving it. Whether that will grow this market to 600,000, I doubt. Um, but it, it's a most unconservative policy. It's, uh, and it would, be, it would be nice to think we yield that much influence over a consumer, but we don't. No, <laughs> you know, no, no. It's the installer. Uh, the consumer is the, um, the installer's customer is the consumer. It's not ours. Uh, our customer is the installer and obviously the merchant. So we're two or three steps away from the consumer. So to believe that we could make them buy a heat pump for the £10,000, whatever, uh, where you know grant-funded heat pumps are struggling to go that way. Um, so we're supposed to try and sell them at full price. It's, uh, I, it's just a big challenge. It's, Put it that way. As I say, it's only a plan at the moment, and I think there's a lot of opposition to it. Really, what I want to talk to you about today is not heat pumps, but I thought I'd just clear that little bit up. But I'd, I'd like to talk to you about gas boilers. I'm assuming gas boilers have still got a future. And so, therefore, um, I just want to talk to you about gas boilers, because a lot of people would be thinking about changing a gas boiler, having another one, and thinking, should I, shouldn't I, given the fact that they're going to be supposedly phased out. So, you know, let, let's, let's look first of all at um, condensing boilers. We get a lot of confusion over this. People say, oh, I don't know whether I've got a condensing boiler or a combi. And so the first thing to say is that condensing boilers basically 
high efficiency boilers come in combi form and also other forms. So do you want to just give us a, a slight overview of that? Because if people are looking to replace their boiler, they're thinking, should I get a combi? Should I get a system boiler? Should I get a heat only boiler? Well, overwhelmingly, the most popular boiler uh, at the moment and for some years has been uh, the combi. And out of the 1.7-ish million boilers sold every year, around 1.2 million of, of them are combis. Was that a Worcester invention? We, we try and claim credit for it. It certainly is a UK manufacturer. We bought our first one in 1971, a floor-standing model, albeit. Um, but it, it was probably active in Europe before then, I expect. Oh, OK. But, I was claiming it as a British invention. That's a shame, isn't it? I think I still will anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, they seem to be the, the boiler of choice for most homes. And I think it's the convenience of instantly heating water only when you want it. And obviously freeing up space for a hot water storage cylinder you won't need, tanks in the roof you don't need. So there's been a lot of um, pluses for it. That, to a degree, is probably coming back to haunt the government now because obviously they want to push us into a heat pump uh, approach and for that you need a, a storage cylinder. But the convenience of just turning on a tap and running water until, you know, infinitum, as long as the tap's on, it will keep pouring out hot water at you. Uh, holds a lot of attraction and they're very simple to install so the installers had a big input onto this as well mm. yeah, yeah it seems to be every time the installer can talk the customer into or out of whatever they they choose whatever is convenient for the installer if you like so let's talk about the downside of combis because there is one isn't there or there are some yeah. downsides the flow rate is probably the biggest difference between a traditional uh, storage system and a combi uh, the most popular combis are around the 30 kilowatt output, which is around two uh, in old money, two and a half to yeah, 2.6, 2.7 gallons a minute flow rate. So they're, they're generally believed to be a single tap at a time operation. You can get higher output ones. In fact, we make one up to 50 kilowatts. Uh, and that's uh, 18 litres a minute flow rate. So that's on par with the storage system. You could run, you know, two baths simultaneously if you have sufficient mains pressure. Yeah, yeah. Well, you do need a decent mains pressure to be able to operate combis correctly and at multiple outlets as well. I, I, one of the things that I think people get very confused about is we've got this thing of flow rate, we've got this thing of pressure, which are two different things. The mains pressure isn't necessarily the flow rate. So if you're going to have a combi, you've got to look at the flow rate, you've got to measure that which is basically putting the taps on and, and seeing how much you get in litres per minute. But the other thing is that that flow rate will change according to the temperature of the water that's coming in. So it's a very cold morning this morning. So the water's coming into the house a lot colder than it would be, say, in the summer. So if you're heating that water up with a combi boiler, it's going to slow the flow down because it's got to heat it up. It's got to get it up to that temperature before it releases it from the boiler into your shower. Is that right? There are some boilers who operate that way. Um, majority, though, the flow rate will stay the same, whether it's summer or winter. Uh, but you personally probably have to slow the flow down yourself at the tap to get it hotter. The calculate, the comparison between combis is all based on a presumption that the mains water is at 10 centigrade. And we add 35 or 40 centigrade to that temperature. And obviously as it comes out of the taps. But if the mains is coming in at like 3 centigrade, which is quite likely today, adding 40 to it will give you a temperature of 43. You could bathe in that, but you're not going to really do the washing up in a hygienic way at 43 centigrade. You, you probably slow the flow rate down subconsciously. You're not thinking of it. You just turn the tap slightly down and the water gets hotter. So in a shower, for example, you would be just, just 
mixing a little less cold water into it. In fact, probably very little cold water at all at 43. You'd be relying on whatever the boiler was delivering out. So people would notice a, a lower flow rate in their shower on a cold morning, yeah? Certainly a lower temperature and to make the temperature hotter, you would lower the flow. Okay, so what, what we're saying then is that you do, you do this massive combi that people could use if they had two bathrooms going, if they wanted to use two showers in the morning simultaneously. But for most people, it's a, it's a single shower. It's one person using the shower at a time. And if they've got a, a more bathrooms, they're probably looking for a different type of boiler. Yeah. yeah, these are single bathroom type applications. They work with an ensuite, which is just periodically used. Um, uh, like I've got a house with two bathrooms in it and an ensuite, and we have a 40 kilowatt combi. Um, but it wouldn't run two baths at a very successful flow rate simultaneously. Then most people don't do that, do they? They don't they actually don't. both both nip into the bath at exactly the same point. So there is that divergence there, I guess, isn't there? When we first started selling the wall hung combis back in 1985, I remember taking phone calls from consumers who couldn't believe this was the flow they were going to get for from this boiler. It was quite alien. Um, they were used to gushing hot water coming out. Um, nowadays, though, I just think we've all got used to it. The fact that if somebody's in the shower, then perhaps I better not run, the, not fill the sink up or something. You know, I'll just wait for the five minutes until they're out. Sounds archaic almost, that behaviour, but it does subconsciously sort of happen. So we've got the limitations of the boiler. If we've yeah. got the limitations of the mains, you know, the flow rate coming from the mains, you can actually do something about that with a mains pump, can't you? You can boost it to a to a certain extent now. That's that's allowed. That never used to be allowed, but they now allow you to to fit a pump onto your mains, onto your incoming mains, to boost your flow rate into the into the boiler. Yeah. Yes, that's right. But it's only up to a maximum of twelve liters a minute. Um, if you want more than that, you would probably have to fill a brake tank with water and then pump it from the outlet of that tank. And sometimes you can do things with the boiler. There's a flow regulator on most boilers, and that could uh, occasionally that gets removed. So it, it's sort of there's no restriction through it. Um, but it is a concern sometimes that uh, water pressure and gas pressure, for that matter, there's a lot of gas replacement pipe work going on. Sometimes they thread the new pipe down the centre of the old pipe, thereby restricting the gas flow volume. And sometimes we get call outs where the boiler was working perfectly before and now it doesn't seem hot enough. And when you measure the gas pressure, it's, uh, it's been restricted by this pipe work replacement type activity. Yeah, well, they should turn the pressure up very slightly to overcome the fact that it's a smaller, <laughs> smaller pipe, really, shouldn't they? But there you go. Um, so w w when we're talking about conventional boilers, we're still talking about condensing boilers here. And this is the thing, high efficiency boilers. All boilers you're selling now are high efficiency, is that right? Yeah, since 2005, uh, the government mandated that only high efficiency condensing boilers could be placed on the market. And since 2018, the, they ratcheted that up a little by saying only boilers with an ERP efficiency of 92% can be placed onto the market. So it's very good, it's you know, probably amongst the best in Europe in terms of uh, the boiler itself. There is some debate always going on though that boilers um, in the UK don't operate as efficiently as their sort of bench efficiency is listed, mainly because of the system. And perhaps the radiators have been sized for high flow temperatures and restricting the boiler from fully condensing as much as it could do. Uh, it's funny how people always state that uh, to, I don't know why, but um, I guess today we're going to get quite a few phone calls though of all these non-condensing boilers, which have got frozen condensate pipes. You've got a nice little video to show people how to thaw out the condensate pipe, haven't you? But yes, we have, yeah. Obviously the best thing is to run the condensate pipe inside. Can you just explain for people, because you know, we've got a varied audience here, we've got a lot of trade viewers, but we've also got householders who just want to increase their knowledge here. Can you just explain very briefly, if you can, about what the condensing 
process is all about? Because people don't really understand that sometimes. Yeah, with a, a condensing boiler, you either have a, quite a large heat exchanger or sometimes two heat exchangers. And what we're trying to do is lower the flue gases, the temperature of the flue gases leaving the boiler. Uh, if we can get them low enough, we will release the latent heat within the flue gases. So they don't become, they don't stay as a gas. Uh, they also become almost like water vapor uh, leaving the boiler. So if we've got a large enough heat exchanger to scrub enough heat out of the flue gases, um, we will release this latent heat. And it adds about 15% efficiency improvement to a standard efficiency boiler. So it's quite a significant amount. The coincidental side effect of that is that this condensate that you've created by lowering the flue gas temperature, uh, that needs to be discharged somewhere. So every condensing boiler has a normally a white coloured plastic overflow type pipe uh, leaving it, uh, going to an internal drain, hopefully, or an external drain uh, to get rid of this condensate that we've created. And it's very acidic as well. So the, the materials within a condensing boiler have to be robust enough to put up with this acidity. So most condensing boilers are either made of aluminium or stainless steel rather than cast iron or copper like non-condensing boilers used to be. Yeah. So a, a sign of a, a, when a boiler is in, ideally you would want to keep the boiler in the condensing mode. You would want to be keeping that flue gas temperature low by taking as much heat out of it as you can so that when that flue gas went out into the open air, you could put your hand in front of it, it wouldn't burn you, it's just a very you know, cool sort of steam, if you like, that you're getting out of it. So a sign that the boiler's condensing well is when you get that plume coming out of the, of yeah. the, the, the flue. Now, as the temperature raises, you know, as the, the house gets warmer and so on, the water's coming back to the boiler hotter and surely that condensing process just stops, doesn't it, at some point? Yes, it, it, it certainly, they'll always condense, but they don't fully condense. That's the critical thing. You know, they, they could be better at it. The hotter the water is, the worse the, that situation. What's the ideal temperature we're trying to keep, say, our return temperature from our radiators or underfloor heating at to, to get that thing working efficiently? Well, the, the hottest you would like to see it is no more than about 52, 53 centigrade. But if you can get it below that, uh, if you get down to like, dare I say, even 30 or 40 centigrade, that's utopia then. It, it's giving you everything. Um, but most of the time, it's about 50 centigrade coming back and it's leaving the boiler at about 70 centigrade. Um, so that you lose 20 centigrade of temperature over the radiators. So they will always generally condense, but you could get a lot more out. And there are ways we do it now. The, the controls can do that. You know, we've got load compensating thermostats, room thermostats, which will sense that the rooms are getting somewhere near temperature and back the boiler off a bit and make it calm down and cool down a little. So that's the efficiency. So basically that's what we're looking for, whether it's a combi boiler or a system boiler or a heat only boiler. Um, can you just tell us something about the difference between a system boiler and a heat only boiler? Because that again is something that confuses people. Yeah, that's relatively new. In the last sort of 25 to 30 years, I'm saying is new. Uh, it's a very European uh, concept. Uh, in Europe, sealed systems are the norm. And in the UK, historically, it was an open vent system. You had a, a small plastic 10-gallon tank up in the roof space, which filled and vented, if you like, the heating system. But in, the, in Europe, it was uh, sealed systems with an expansion vessel and uh, basically sealed from the atmosphere. So a sealed system boiler, or a system boiler as we know it, has some of that apparatus in there. So it has an expansion vessel, safety valve, pressure gauge, and the circulating pump. Uh, and sometimes uh, you, it either has one or you can fit an optional diverting valve into the boiler as well. So the diverter valve then wouldn't need to be plumbed into the uh, sort of airing cupboard cylinder area to divert water one way or the other. Got it. So it, when it's coming out, it's coming out 
with two pipes, one going to the heating and one going to the hot water cylinder. Yeah, and one combined return. Sometimes it's a one. It's two returns and one flow, or two flows and one return. Depends how the manufacturer has designed it. But it, it's a sort of labour-saving thing for installers. A lot of the pipe work they would have to create would be done for them if they bought a system boiler. Whereby a regular boiler, as they're nowadays called, we used to call them conventional boilers back in the day, but regular is the expression now. That's quite literally just a heat cell uh, on the wall. It's just a heat exchanger and obviously the combustion equipment. And you connect to that, your pipe work, it's two pipes nowadays because every system has to be fully pumped. And the two pipes then go into the sort of airing covered area where you would create you would install the pump and the diverting valves and things like that. Um, as you can see then, the, the, the labour involved fitting a regular boiler f on a totally new system is uh, probably a day or so longer to do than it would be with a system boiler. Yeah, but the great thing is anybody that's got all that already in and they just want a new boiler, if they've got the cylinder, they've got the diverter valves in the air and cupboard, they can just buy a, a heat-only boiler as a direct replacement almost for their, their old boiler, yeah? And that's probably the case most of the time. Most of the regular systems, shall we say, traditional systems are in, and all of the boilers virtually sold into that arena are replacements for, a, you know, a failed one. So it's good that you're still doing those, isn't it? So, you know, you're, you're taking care of that end of the market as well, yeah? yeah? So, uh, you know, if okay, people are re replacing boilers, and we talked earlier about the fact that, you know, there's still some life left in gas boilers. People don't have to worry immediately about the fact that they're going to be phased out. But how long would you say, and I know this is really difficult for you, but what would you say is the life expectancy of a boiler? Because it used to be, when I, when I started, it was about 30 years. You'd get an old cast iron boiler and you were quite happy that it would run for... 30 years that's no longer the case is it we estimate ours will last around 12 to 15 years um so it's it's a reasonable life for something which is uh, to purchase less than a thousand pounds you know you probably have four iphones in the same <laughs> period of time each of them costing a thousand pounds so for something which goes through so much work I, I still would argue it's great value for money um, but yeah, you're right, uh, the boilers of yesteryear were made of thick cast iron or mild steel. They, the efficiencies of them weren't as good, but the, you know they didn't have as many targets put upon them on emissions and things like that. So you could make them out of these really robust materials. And it is non-typical to get a phone call from somebody with a 50-year-old oil boiler. Yeah. And of course, we're talking about gas boilers, but you also make oil boilers as well, don't you? So you, yeah. you're in that, that arena as well. Um, I had a bit of a heated debate with a guy the other week on a Jeremy Vine show, and he was talking about how bad the gas boiler is for the environment and about all the knocks coming out of it and the fact that it was making kids you know, asthma worse and all the rest of it. What, what, what would you say? And I know, again, you are a boiler manufacturer, you sell boilers, so, you know, people have got to understand that. But what would you say about, I mean, obviously they've been cleaned up a lot, gas boilers, haven't they? So we were allowed back in the day to create boilers that could produce up to 260 milligrams per kilowatt hour of NOx or nitrous oxides. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays, it has to be below 40. So where does that sit, that 40, in, in relation to other things? I'd struggle to answer that. I don't know the NOx emission levels of a car, for instance. Um, yeah. It'd be but, interesting. I mean, we might look at that as a separate thing. Sorry to put you on the spot there. But, yeah, it's fine. But, yeah. but it's, it's pretty low, isn't it? It's pretty low. It, it is. And, and the hydrogen-ready boilers we've been working on, that's even lower. That's below 25 milligrams per kilowatt hour. So, yes, it's as low as it's ever been. We spoke about hydrogen. Obviously, we've done a whole video on hydrogen, so I don't want to go too far back into that. But it's a lot of people going, oh, hydrogen leaks like crazy. It's the smallest molecule known to man. We're going to have explosions right, left and centre. And I've been saying to people, well, look, there's a lot of work going on. I, I attended a webinar uh, a few weeks ago by the hydrogen group, which is basically the HSE and all sorts of other people who are looking at hydrogen safety. 
And so what's your view on that? Obviously, as a boiler manufacturer, if you're doing something with hydrogen, it's got to be leak proof. Very much, yeah. There's no question. It has smaller molecules. It has the potential to leak, uh, probably more so than natural gas. But the, as you've already said, the test work going on is just remarkable. We're, we're replacing the entire grid NEO with polyethylene pipe work. That's something we started 15 years ago. So the entire grid will be suitable for hydrogen in, in the 2030s. And all the techniques we use today, soldered, copper pipe work, et cetera, will be what will be used in people's properties. I have no doubt whatsoever it will be as safe as natural gas in that respect, but it's going to be safer than natural gas from its carbon monoxide uh, production because there is none. You know, all of the issues we get with gas, which are very few, uh, are generally carbon monoxide incidents and hydrogen doesn't produce any carbon at all. So it's safer than natural gas rather than de more dangerous, as the newspaper says. Yeah, it's just the explosions, obviously. If <laughs> one explosion is a, is a if, for the person who's involved in it, you know, the victim, it's uh, one too many, obviously, isn't it? So we can't make light of that problem. But I think that maybe one of the things that we will be doing in the future is to limit the amount of gas pipe that's actually inside the building. Because if you think about it, your gas meter is now housed outside the building very often. Yeah. And you can run a piece of pipe outside the building to the boiler, in through the wall. So you could end up with as little as, say, half a meter of gas pipe yes. actually inside the building, couldn't you? Yeah, very much, yes. Yeah. It's quite a common thing nowadays. I see the pipe run around the outside of the building. Um, yeah, and it is possible we may have to change the gas supply pipes to many of our existing boilers should hydrogen become a thing. Yeah, if, if people have got steel, what I call steel barrel in there, you know, the old iron yeah, pipe, yeah, there, yeah. That, yeah. That, would ha that would have to go. But again, you know, no worse than when we changed over to North Sea gas. So you weren't born then, but um, when, when we did that, we had a lot of conversion work to do. And Thames gas was 50% hydrogen. So we've been there before. I'm just going to get my bread, okay. Okay, yeah, lovely. <laughs> Martin's gone off to get his bread. He's got, uh, he's got a loaf in the oven. Uh, he's got a gas oven. <laughs> you, you, we talked about life expectancy and the other thing that people are very keen on obviously is that you get a, a, a much better warranty now than you used to get on gas boilers don't you yeah oh yes it's uh, at least five years and i've seen them up to 10 years 12 years you know it's a commercial um selling part of the boiler really is long warranties it's, it's a hell of a commitment for people, isn't it, to give a warranty of that length on a gas boiler because, you know, best for laid plans and all that. We know things do go wrong in the end. Of course, uh, yes. What, I mean, I, I'm assuming, uh, the ones I know about, they, they're dependent upon you having an annual service to keep this warranty valid, if you like. So they, they insist upon you having it serviced every year. Um, is that... I mean, obviously, you've got to say that's, that is strictly necessary to have a, an annual service on a boiler, but they don't actually do very much when they come in, do they, the service guys nowadays? Uh, it depends on the, the service engineer you are using, perhaps. But um, the, we think it, you know, it's a requirement in landlord-tenant situations for an annual gas safety check. So every year, the boiler must be checked and all the appliances normally the engineer present services the boiler whilst he's there and we can't understand why that isn't a requirement for private homes private householders it's exactly the same boiler that we sell to a private household as we do to a landlord so what is the difference why why should one have to do it and the other one not to um so we firmly are behind um support in service of annual servicing of a boiler particularly nowadays as there's so many changes taking place to the gas supply so we're trying to decarbonize and so that you get anaerobic digestion systems dotted around the country injecting biomethane into the gas supply which they've got from waste and sewerage and you get this black bag uh, biomethane as well which is like food waste and things they call it um, we're getting small elements of hydrogen being injected into the gas. So the consistency of the gas is still very good, but it is changeable. 
So a service, uh, I think, is an annual service would prevent any distress breakdowns, any contamination of the heat cell, uh, and it's mainly down to the gas now being quite variable. Uh, even the, the methane gas from where, where it comes, you know, it's imported, much of it is. Um, so, yeah, it, it protects the boiler, protects the homeowner, uh, and obviously keeps the warranty live and valid. Because some manufacturers as well will possibly ask for a proactive part replacement, even though the boiler is working perfectly, a bit like your car. Hmm. You know, every time you have your car service or every second or third service of a car, there is something they will change because it's not going to last 15 years uh, or whatever the life of the car is. So boiler manufacturers, some boiler manufacturers ask you to change this seal or that uh, component. I used to do it 30, 40 years ago. I used to change a thermocouple on every gas boiler I service. Did this, you really? Yeah, this five quid pass would just always fail when I've driven down the road. So why not include that in the service? So it's returning a little bit to how, you know, we were, it's like oil boilers, you change the nozzle on every service. It's still functioning okay with the old nozzle, but you just don't know. So for the sake of this quite inexpensive bit, it's worth replacing it. So two or three reasonable, you know, excuses or reasons why you should have it serviced annually. Okay, when we're talking about spares then, replacing bits and pieces on a boiler, how long before you stop selling spares for a specific model? Is there a law that says you have to carry on for a, a certain amount of time? I'm not aware of a law, but we are in this circular economy now where reuse and recycle is everything. If you, years ago, if you were trying to sell your boilers to British Gas, they used to be what they called British Gas Service Listed. And for British Gas to take on a boiler that they hadn't fitted or installed even on a service contract, it, it, they'd had nothing to do with it before. And that boiler itself needed to be service listed. And part of the requirement to get service listed was that you carried spare parts for 10 years after the last day of manufacture. So most of us do that at least for 10 years and, and for longer. Uh, you, you won't get certain things like a side panel or a front cover or something like that, but the functioning parts, the uh, components which you know, make the thing work, they're at least 10 years and sometimes longer. But it's, it's difficult for the boiler manufacturer because most of the components come from a component supplier. And if you're now not buying 500,000 components a year off them to keep making this boiler, you're only buying 1,000 a year off them for spare parts, then they themselves are sort of thinking, it's not worth my time doing this, it's expensive to do this. So it's more the component supplier to the manufacturer who chooses to end it. But written into all of our contracts with them is this 10-year minimum supply. And then we'll generally buy, you know, another few years of supply and stock them. That's comforting to know anyway. But the other thing that I've noticed is that you're now making things a lot more modular so that if you do replace something, you replace, say, the gas water section as a whole piece, you know, so it's a plug-in unit rather than people having to tinker around with individual bits and pieces. Is that right? We make them in that way, but no, most installers will still change. If the pressure relief valve, for instance, is leaking, they will put a new pressure relief valve onto this hydraulic unit that we've created. I guess it would be perfect if any component was to fail on that hydraulic unit. They just took the whole thing off, put a brand new one on and sent it back to us to refurbish it. But no, they, they mostly just change an individual component. They may take the entire unit out, change the component and put the entire unit back in. But no, it's uh, it's still individual bits. Okay, yeah. Just, I think some some guys may be just charging for the whole, the whole uh, unit. Yeah. <laughs> Good to talk to you again, Martin. And um, as I say, uh, you know, it helps to uh, kill some of those rumours about the fact that uh, boilers... Uh, uh, you know, that it's not worth replacing your gas boiler now because they'll be phased out before the life of the boiler. We we still reckon we've got 12, 15 years of, of life in these boilers. So 
um, you can let them run their full full life, yeah? The only sort of planned deadline for the end of gas boiler sales, gas as we know it, is 2035. So we've got at least 13 or 14 years with gas boilers as we know them. And by then, I'm sure, we'll, well before then, we'll be selling hydrogen-ready boilers. And in fact, the plan for that is 2026. Oh, okay. Um, so every boiler placed on the market from 2026, uh, they haven't decided specifically yet, but they're consulting on this. But the, the plan is that from 2026, every boiler placed on the market must be convertible to hydrogen. Um, and all of the manufacturers are ready and wanting this and uh, you know, waiting for the decision from government. I think there's a bright future there. I really do. I don't think that gas boiler is going to finish um, any time soon no. myself. And so, uh, you know, there'd be people who would be pleased about that. People would be very unhappy about that. Maybe some of those heat pump manufacturers would uh, be very unhappy about that. But um, we'll see. Anyway, it's great to talk to you again. Thanks. I mean, I'm sure people will find that uh, illuminating again. Thanks, Roger. It's a pleasure. Anytime. Cheers. Thank you. All right. Cheers.